I think we need to explain how this event fits into the larger stream of American history. It was a remarkable distillation of so much that's wrong <laughs> with American history that was paraded right before our eyes this week. So I'm willing to bet we can even find some things that are right with American history if we look hard enough. Well, <laughs> let's work our way toward that, okay? Okay. So l- l- let's take the first pass uh, with wondering about the way that people struggle to find the right language to describe what we were seeing. Uh, it felt like as if we were making up new vocabularies along mm. the way. I-, I wonder if you all could help me think about that. Joanne, looking at it from a broader perspective, what, what struck you? Well, I guess one of the things that struck me is, um, you know, there are any number of, of terms people are throwing around, KKK, Nazi, neo-Nazi, neo-Confederate. I mean, there's we could make a huge list. But some of them, and Nazi is one of them, that word, although in popular culture, Nazi equals bad guy. In historical memory, Nazi equals bad guy. Also in popular culture and historical memory, Nazis aren't Americans. Right. And Mm -hmm. that term to me masks the part of this that we have to most aggressively grapple with, which is that these Mm -hmm. aren't thems. These are uses. These are Americans doing what they're doing. And I think it's too easy. I think it's a default position is to say, well, that's just them, or that's just a small group, or that's just... Well, I've been in conversations in which uh, people who had seen themselves as the keeper of Confederate iconography are distraught over the mixture of this alien Hmm. Nazi symbols alongside the Confederate ones, because there's a sense among people who identify themselves primarily as descendants of the Confederacy that they lost something uh, in this sort of mashup Hmm. of iconography. Hmm. And on the other side, as we try to describe this, the phrase white supremacy is both accurate but seems so broad that it doesn't have as much of a bite as it needs to have. And the word racism, too. What words should we use to talk about what it is that we've been seeing here? Oh, I, I'm actually quite comfortable using the term white supremacy, although I would recognize that it can be kind of everywhere and nowhere and that it loses a, some of its analytic specificity yeah, if that's, you apply it. that's really it. what I meant. But. but in a case like the protests in Charlottesville, we should feel, in my opinion, at least as a historian, very comfortable talking about white supremacy when you have people saying themselves white power, when they're saying themselves that I am for the white nation or saying I'm voting for the president precisely because of what he represents. So in that sense, it's kind of like the old adage, you know, when somebody tells you who they are, believe them. Um, I tend to think it's quite okay to use it in, in that instance for sure. I find that very compelling. You know, one of the things that struck me in, in watching these events unfold has to do with the statues themselves. You know, I mean, There's the statue of Lee that's at the center of all this. The evening before, people were gathered around a statue of Thomas Jefferson. And um, what came to mind for me was there's a very famous print of New York City uh, towards the beginning of the revolution, and it's New Yorkers pulling down a statue of King George. Wow. It's a group of them, and they have ropes, and they're tugging, and they're pulling. And the, the symbolism of that for the American Revolution was intensely powerful. And watching all of this swirling emotion around essentially these statues, it's a reminder, I guess it's a reminder among other things, of their iconic value and and the power of that. You know, somebody who's thought about these statues and studied the time that they were put up around the turn of the 20th century and what the people who put them up invested in them and believed that they were going to say forever and that they were forever going to hold up Robert E. Lee as the embodiment of, of Christian gentlemanly virtue, it's remarkable to see how in less than a decade they have come under assault. Now, we know from the newspapers at the time that black people, when these statues went up, said, no. This this is not speaking for all of us. We know what this is. We know this is a symbol of your authority, your power, that you lost the war, but you're still holding on to this local dominion. And so African-American people had resented uh, and resisted these statues, but they had stood there mute from the viewpoint of most people. You know, they were like the furniture of mm-hmm. Charlottesville, those statues. You know, have lived here for a long time, and there they were. Uh, but suddenly— 
they have come under assault. So when the Lee statue in Charlottesville was put up in 1924, commissioned in 1917, that would have been a time when black voter turnout in Virginia would have been virtually nil. Mm -hmm. It would have been a time when Virginia passed the Racial Purity Act that established an office to maintain surveillance over people's birth certificates to make sure that nobody accidentally married a, quote, Negro, right? Mm -hmm. So the spirit in which these statues were put up were one of great confidence in the superiority Mm -hmm. and complete dominance of white people. 